So with lesson seven, we're hitting our third and final day of some max min questions. Uh, just two questions. Uh, they are probably two of the uh, most intense ones that we've got. And uh, we're going to dive right into them. The first one's about a, a little construction sidewalk cover. And I've just grabbed a picture from the internet here. Often in big cities when they're working on a high rise, they want to make sure nothing falls on people down on the sidewalk. They'll put a little cover over the sidewalk. And then they can do some construction. They don't have to worry about people getting hurt. And I'm wondering, like, if you were to try to take a ladder and go from the road up past the corner of this uh, little cover and then up to the building, how long would that ladder have to be? What's the minimum length of ladder that will reach? If your ladder is too short, you know, it might just kind of do this kind of thing, right? It might not actually reach. Um, somewhere in there is the, the minimum ladder length where you can at least get some contact uh, between the building and the ground on the other side of the sidewalk cover. So the cover itself is two meters by three meters. And um, we're going to we're gonna start by actually saying, okay, let's break this ladder up into two parts. There's like the lower part of the ladder and then the upper part of the ladder. And together, those two L's are going to make the entire ladder. Now, I'm actually going to kind of parameterize this problem. I'm going to describe this problem by looking at angle choices down here. Somewhere in there, there is an angle that would actually have the smallest possible ladder. If you get the wrong angle, you'll need to have a really long ladder like this, right? Like, so here's an angle that's just way too small between the road and the ladder. And so you don't want that angle because look how long the ladder would have to be. The L1 part would be massive. The L2 is pretty short, but the L1 part would be really big. And by the same reasoning, you don't want to go with an angle that's actually too big because then you'd have a ladder that goes way up into the sky in order for it to finally touch. Somewhere in there is a particular angle that has the smallest ladder length that you need in order to make contact. And that's what we're shooting for, right? You can kind of imagine it's like this. Imagine there's a graph out there that records how long the ladder would need to be based on your choice and angle and somewhere in there there's going to be this minimum that's what we want to find we actually want to find this what would that length be but to get there we're actually going to find well what would the angle be that would be perfect okay well getting our story right i've got my picture here comes my formula just kind of thinking about how the trigonometry would work in here looking at this l1 that's a hypotenuse and then the three is opposite that angle we could say that sine of theta would equal 3 divided by L1. And if you want to solve for L1, you could say L1 is equal to 3 all divided by sine theta. I guess you could call that cosecant theta if you wanted. For the length 2 portion, okay, up there, um, same angle, right? The angle would be right there. It's a little similar triangle. And up here, I'm just kind of looking at the 2, which is adjacent, and the L2 is a hypotenuse. We could talk about cosine. We could say, okay, cosine of the angle would actually be 2 divided by latter part 2. So latter part 2 would be 2 divided by the cosine of theta. Okay, well, let's write this whole thing out. Looks like the entire length of your ladder depends on your angle theta. Hopefully we can make a smart choice. We just need to add the two ladder portions together, ladder one and ladder two. So we're going to have a three sitting on top of sine theta plus a two sitting on top of a cosine theta. We just want to try to make that as small as we can. Now, I want to be smart about this, so I'm going to make this as easy for me as I can. I'm going to write that like this. 3 sine of theta to the negative 1 plus 2 cos of theta all to the negative 1. Not inverse sine or inverse cos, just upside down sine and cos. You know, cosecant and secant, I guess. Okay, I know it's never a fun thing to do, but let's talk about the interval. Now that we've got this written in terms of one variable, theta, right? What is the interval for theta? What's the biggest and smallest it can make can be and actually make any sense? 
And the answer is the angle could be pretty much as small as zero, but soft edge. And it could get as big, you know, when you're right up here where the angle right there would be 90 degrees, or I guess we should call it pi over two, but you can't quite make it pi over two. You can't quite make it 90 degrees. Otherwise your ladder would go infinitely far up into the sky. So soft edges, which basically means, you know, there's nothing really interesting hiding in there. It's going to have to be the calculus that finds the answer. Okay, it's time to do a derivative. So I'm going to go and do a dl d theta. And I'm looking right here to try to do that derivative. So I'm going to do some chain rule here. I'm going to have that negative 1 come down. I'm going to have negative 3. And then that blob sine of theta to the negative 2 times cosine of theta. A little chain rule action. Then moving on to the next part plus a negative 2 cosine of theta all to the negative 2 times, oh, it's going to be a negative sine theta. Okay, I'm just going to rewrite that, start to tidy this up. Eventually, I'm going to look for a critical point. Right now, it's just really a mess. I need some help here. I could write this as negative 3 cosine of theta, all sitting on top of sine squared. And then a double negative here. This would be plus 2 sine theta, all sitting on top of cosine squared theta. Okay, well, I, I really am troubled by the fact that there are two fractions there. It's difficult for me to go and find critical points. So I'm going to head towards a common denominator. And it looks to me like the least common denominator would actually be those two denominators bunched together. It would be sine squared theta multiplied by cosine squared theta. Right, just kind of bumped together like that. So let's let's rewrite it that way see what we've got. So it looks like dl d theta would be all in one fraction. Down on the bottom I've got sine squared theta times cos squared theta. That's how you could say that. Up in the top, this first fraction needs to get hit with cosine squared top and bottom. And so we're going to end up with a minus 3 cosine cubed theta. That fraction, the second one, needs to get kicked with a sine squared top and bottom. So we're going to have plus 2 sine cubed theta. Wow, that is a bit of a mess, isn't it? So we're, we're kind of wondering, critical points here, could that be 0 or could you break it? Now let's talk about the breaking at first. That would be if either sine of theta or cosine of theta is equal to zero. That would happen if your angle was either zero or 90, or I guess I should say zero or pi over two. But remember, looking back here at the interval, you're not quite allowed to get all the way down to zero or all the way up to pi over two. So, you know, nice try, but really no, not quite there. Now the top. Is there a way that you can get that to work? And the answer is yes, but it's tough to go and find it. So let's go on a little journey here and see if we can find out what that perfect value for theta will be. And I don't have a lot of room, but I'm going to see if I can get this to work. I would sit here and I would go, okay, I have to go and get that equal to zero. That would happen when two sine cubed theta is equal to 3 cos cubed theta. Best thing to do right now is to divide both sides by sine cubed. Sorry, but I'm going to repeat, my, I'm going to say this again, correction here. Divide both sides by cosine cubed theta. If you go and do a sine divided by a cos, you end up creating a tan. So I can create a tan cubed of theta by just doing this. And that'll eliminate it 
from this side. I'm also going to divide by 2. And so I end up with tan cubed of theta is equal to 3 over 2. Or another way to say that, tan of theta is equal to the cube root of 3 over 2. So there is an angle out there, and I'm going to go and get it right now. I've got just enough room on the paper to get there. Uh, I'm going to put my calculator in radian mode. It is. Perfect. I'm going to take 3 divided by 2, and now I'm going to go and do the cube root of that. So math, cube root of that last answer. Okay, so there's the cube root of 3 over 2, and now I'm going to inverse tan that. This is just the perfect sized angle, 0.8527. That angle there will actually give you the smallest possible ladder length. Okay, well, it's actually fairly easy now to finish this off. We've found the perfect angle. Now we're just going to go back and go and get that smallest length that we can get. Remember, we've got that function that has L as a function of theta. I'm just going to go back up and show it to you here. It was right before we did the calculus. It was right here. This 3 sine upside down plus 2 cosine upside down. I'm just going to go and substitute into that and see what I get. So the smallest possible ladder is going to be 3 all on top of the sine of this angle that we just found plus 2 all on top of the cosine of this angle that we just found, this angle right here. It's going to get dropped into that machine. And when I tried that out, I found that the smallest possible ladder length happens when that angle is 0.8527 radians and it ends up being a ladder that is 7.0234 meters long. Not the easiest question, that's for sure, but that is the smallest possible ladder that can actually reach from the ground all the way up to the building. Before we go and take a look at uh, the final example, number 10, I want to just show you another way that you might see this question. Um, I've worded it as, hey, what's the smallest possible ladder that will make it? You can come up with the identical math with a story that looks something like this. What if you have some hallways that are connecting, right? It's going to end up being the exact same math. So you're in a building and there are some hallways that are connecting. Maybe this hallway here is three meters wide. And then you go into a slightly narrower hallway, and they might say, oh, okay, without lifting the ladder to go up near the roof, what is the longest possible ladder that you can actually have go around the corner? If your ladder is too long, like this one, you'll never get it to go around the corner in the hallway. Um, but if the ladder is just short enough, then it will work. And it turns out this story where it's like, hey, what is the longest possible ladder that makes it around the corner? is identical to our math for what's the shortest possible ladder that can actually go over top of this little sidewalk protection structure. So same math, just a kind of a different scenario in order to get you there. Okay, final max min question. Also another tough one. Um, this one here talks about people trying to lay a, an electrical cable um, from some place on a beach all the way out to an island and that's what this little splotch out here is going to be and so it says a communication cable needs to be installed to a resort island from a nearby beach city the island is 20 miles offshore okay so this is 20 for the distance and 40 miles down the coast from the city okay so from the city to the point on the beach that is as close as you can get that is a 40. It costs $4,000 per mile to install the cable on land and $9,000 per mile to install it over water. It's more expensive to work in the water. 
And so you're going to try to figure out the best option to spend the least amount of money for this cable. Well, it turns out that the best thing to do is to actually run the cable along the beach because it's cheap. And then at some point, it's not totally clear when, the calculus will show us, make a turn and then go as straight as you can through the water doing a little diagonal. That's the best way to go. You don't want to go right to here and then turn. That's actually more expensive. And you don't want to go straight through the water because it's a little bit cheaper to work on the land. So we just have to figure out like where do you make that transition from running the cable along the beach to running it through the water. Now there are many ways you can set this up. I want to show you one. How about we call this distance in here x. We're going to go and find that perfect distance. Um, I guess that leaves as a constraint, that leaves this distance along the beach as 40 minus x. Okay, so I'm getting my constraints kind of in there. Well, we're at it. It's never a fun task. Nobody likes it. So let's get it out of the way. Let's talk about the interval. What's the interval for x values? In this story, what is the smallest possible x that makes sense? And what is the biggest possible x that makes sense? And the smallest x would be if you went right to here and had an x of 0. So you could go hard edge with a 0. I don't think it's a good idea, but you could. And the biggest x could be would be if you just went into the water right away and the x could be 40, hard edge. Okay, let's start laying down our cost function. I'm going to call that c for cost. And it's going to be a function of x. It depends on your choice in x. Okay, for every mile you go on the land, it costs you $4,000. So we're going to have 4000 times 40 minus x. Then when you go in the water, it's going to be 9,000 for every one of those diagonal miles. Well, it's a diagonal. It's a Pythagoras story. So we're going to have in here x squared plus 20 squared. Okay, x squared plus 400. Okay, I'm just going to clean this up as much as I can this cost function, which I'm trying to make as small as I can, right? That's my goal. Minimize this thing. Get the C really small. That's going to equal, what do we have here? Kind of multiplying this all out, we're going to have 160,000 minus 4,000x and then plus 9,000 multiplied by this root. I'm going to write it this way. Get ready to do some calculus. Okay, great. There's my cost function. I want to try to find the minimum value on this thing. I'm going for some critical points. Let's do a derivative here. You know, we're kind of imagining that there's a graph out there of, hey, what's your cost based on, hey, what's your choice in X? And we want to catch that minimum. So it's time to do a derivative. So DC DX. Here we go. It's going to get a little tough. And then it'll get even tougher when we try to just solve for equaling zero. Well, the derivative of 160,000, that part's easy. It's nothing. Then the derivative of this next term would be minus 4,000. And then I bump into this mess. Okay, so plus the 9,000 hangs around, constant multiple rule. The half shows up. Got that blob of algebra. All to the negative one half. And then the derivative of that blob, which would be a 2x. And I want to know when that thing is equal to zero or busted. And I got to clean this up. It's a bit messy here. This this half and this two, they're going to cancel. Okay, I'm going to just rewrite this. I'm just trying to get my bearings here. Getting ready to find that critical point. I've got a negative 4,000. And now what do we have? There's a 9,000 up in the top. And then there's this root down in the bottom. And there's also this x up in the top. So it looks kind of like this. 9,000x all on top of this root. Okay, it looks like that. I got to get a common denominator. That's my only chance of getting this thing to work. 
the common denominator is going to be that awful looking root. So it's going down there in the bottom. Okay, up here we're going to have negative 4,000 times that root x squared plus 400 plus 9,000 x. And we're wondering, is there any way that we could get that derivative, that dc dx? Can we go for a critical point? Can we make it zero? Could we break it? You know, any options of doing that? Well, you can't break it. There's no way you can get this root under here to be zero. So that that's a never. But maybe, maybe we can actually get that zero to happen. Um, we're going to have to just take this aside here and do a little bit of work. That would be when negative 4,000 times this root, I'm just looking at the top, plus 9,000x is equal to zero. Okay, just got to tidy this up. I'm, I'm going to divide everything, like both terms, by 1,000. I don't need to see all those zeros. And I'm going to move one of those to the other side. So I'm going to have 9x instead of 9,000x is equal to 4 times this root. There, I, I divided this term by 1,000 by dropping all those zeros on the 4,000. Um, it's an irrational equation, so I'm going to square both sides. I'm going to have 81x squared is equal to 16 multiplied just by an honest x squared plus 400. Oh, this is looking quadratic. We've got 81 x squared is equal to 16 x squared plus 6,400. Looks like 65 x squared is equal to 6,400. Dividing by 65, x squared is around, oh, what is that? Let's just check here. 6,400 divided by 65. Yeah, roughly, I'll keep it on my calculator, but roughly 98.46. Now I'm going to take a square root. Okay, your very best x is 9.9227 miles. We're getting close. We have found the best place to turn and start going into the water. It's when you're 9.9227 miles away. Now we're supposed to go and just double check our cost here because they did say, you know, find that least expensive option. Well, let's go and check out our cost for a few different options. We really should check the endpoints, right? We had this interval up here and it did have hard edges to it, 0 and 40 right there. Let's just go and see how things look if we try 0. We'll try this 9 number, right? this 9.9227, and we're going to try the 40 and see all these different costs. What does it cost to run the cable? When I tried the 0 for X option, which means go right along the beach until you're right across from the little island and then go through the water, that was pretty expensive. That was $340,000 to run the cable. When I tried it 9.9227 miles away doing the turn, the cost was down a little bit. It was $321,245.16. And when you're going with an X value of 40, which means to just go into the water right away, the cost for that was, was pretty high, actually. $402,000. So the very best one, the one that you should go with, is this one right here. Can't do better than that. Where you turn 9.9227 miles from that point of closest approach and then start swimming through the water. And speaking of swimming, before we actually just 
finish this lesson up here. I want to tell you about a variant on this story where it's the same math, but just with a slightly different story coming into it. It's, it's called the lifeguard question. And so imagine you've actually got a lifeguard standing on the pool deck right here, doing what lifeguards do, just watching the swimmers, making sure people are safe. And the beach is like the pool deck. And then right here could be maybe some sort of, you know, drowning swimmer that needs to be rescued. And the question is, what's the best way for the lifeguard to get to them in the shortest amount of time? They could just dive in the water and start swimming right away, diagonally out to the person. But you can't swim as fast as you can run on the deck. So maybe, maybe they should go and just run on the deck until they're as close as they can get to the person, stop, and then dive in the water and then swim to the person. Well, you could do that. But the best choice is kind of like doing what we did here, putting this cable in the water. The best option is to run along the deck for a little bit and then at some point go and swim through the water diagonally. And it's the exact same calculus in the story, but for the lifeguard question, you want to minimize the time. So I think there's just enough room here that we can sneak in the lifeguard story right here. I think we can pull it off. So if you're doing the story for the lifeguard, I can't spell. That doesn't look right. There we go. So for the lifeguard story, you want to minimize time. And when you're trying to figure out time for your rescue, I know that distance is velocity times time. Well, let's rearrange that. Time would be distance you go divided by velocity. And so you actually have two times. You have the time when you're running and then the time when you're swimming. And you would want to be focused on using this idea to calculate those times and then add them together. So you would say, okay, my overall time for my rescue, it would actually be my distance I have to run along the deck you know, maybe 40 meters minus X, if we mimic our little cable story, divided by, and then here you would put your running speed. I don't know, how fast can people run? Maybe, maybe like six meters per second, right? That might be your running speed. Okay, so that's what this is. That's your run speed. And then you'd have to add on the amount of time it's going to take you to swim through the water. So you're going to swim diagonally. You're going to have that Pythagoras thing going on there again, where you've got x squared plus 20 squared, take a square root. That's how far you have to swim. And then you would divide that. I'm just looking at this highlighted blue part here. You would divide that by your swim speed. I, I don't know. Let's just make up a swim speed. Maybe you're not a fast swimmer. Maybe it's two meters per second. And it's basically the same plan. In terms of laying out the Pythagoras, but here you'd be trying to minimize time as opposed to minimizing the cost. And then the algebra would follow through pretty much exactly the same way. So those last two examples for max min are definitely more involved. Um, but you'll see them. They're kind of some classic Max Min questions, so it's probably good that we've gone over them. And that's going to finish up our lesson uh, for, uh, for this video and in general for our Max Min uh, questions.